you would take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 69, and we're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 to 3. Um, there's sometimes a, uh, it's something weird happens when Jason is leading us in worship, and that I get really, really into it and excited as I was today, but at the same time I get so anxious to preach because, yes, we're singing these truths, and now we're going to preach these truths, and part of me is like, keep going, Jason, and part of me is like, hurry up, Jason, come on. Uh, so, anyway, thank you, brother, it's good to have you back. Uh, Psalm 69, verses 1 to 3 this morning. Uh, we're in our series, Intimacy with God. We're, uh, we've got about four weeks left, and then we'll be going into the Advent season, probably a couple of special messages along those lines, uh, not because it's required by Scripture, but just because it's a, it's a wonderful occasion to focus on uh, the incarnation of Christ, the subordination of Christ, etc. Uh, I'm going to spend two weeks on this particular psalm. Let me tell you why. Not that you need to know this, but why not? Uh, this is Reformation Day within the church history, and there are churches that uh, will set aside this Sunday, either if it falls on Halloween the 31st or if it falls on the following Sunday, um, and they will honor heroes of the faith do a brief commentary on John Knox or William Tyndale or somebody, uh, Martin Luther, who was involved in the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but the Protestant Reformation is far bigger than uh, Luther and Calvin. It's, it goes, it's very geographically expansive. Uh, it covered many, many years. Um, and uh, there was so much that I wanted to choose from. And I finally just decided, amidst all the dental pain and everything, I'm going to put that off until uh, future installment, probably towards the end of this year. So we'll come back to that and maybe have a special service around the Reformation. Uh, so that gives us two weeks on this psalm. And we've been looking at these psalms, and all of them really contain deep emotions. Psalm 42, Psalm 55, Psalm 62, they are all about desperation and desperate circumstances. And Psalm 69 uh, is no, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Good grief. No exception. Thank you. Uh, these psalms remind us that when hard times come, God wants to use our pain and grief as an instrument for causing us to develop that intimacy that we've been talking about. That deeper intimacy. He wants our prayer lives to be transparent, utterly transparent. This psalm begins with a desperate plea, and for most of its duration it's a desperate plea, although there is a hopeful note at the very end. We're not going to look at all 36 verses, uh, either this week or next, but we are going to hit some of the highlights. And I titled this message this morning, Seeking to Rise No More. Maybe you remember the hymn that we grew up singing Love lifted me, love lifted me. The first stanza uh, says, uh, see, uh, let's see, how does it go? I was going to try to refresh you all the point from memory. Uh, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained with sin, seeking to rise no more. But the master, I love this expression, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. You know, sometimes our own sin can make us feel like we're being dragged down. But sometimes it's the sins of others, and sometimes it's just our circumstances. And in any case, the point being is that the Master is here to hear our cry and to lift us to safety. So let's look at the psalm together. This is God's holy word, and I'm going to read from Psalm 69, verses 1 to 3. Follow along with me, if you would, in your copy of God's holy word. For the choir director... According to Shoshanim, a psalm of David, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would give us, that you would illuminate these truths so that we would see clearly what you have for us. Help us to rightfully understand your word and then obediently apply it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Now this section of the psalm, you'll notice, starts out, Save me, O God, and then it says, While I wait for my God. And what that tells me is, is that the psalmist David wants us to think about, perhaps contemplate, what do we do between the time that we cry out to God and the time that God answers? What do we do while we're waiting? And if you read through the Psalms and you see this expression of waiting, I'm waiting for God, I'm waiting for God, 
Don't think of this like waiting at Kroger for your groceries to be scanned or waiting for a stoplight to change. It's not that kind of trivial waiting. It is a declaration of faith. I'm waiting with hope in the God who can save me. Does that require patience? Most certainly it does. It does require patience. Save, faith does not become sight overnight. So David cries out, save me, O God, and he prays that because he knows that God is fully capable of saving him. Amen? I mean, God is capable. And you know, because he knows God cares about his circumstances, he's able to pray with confidence. Now, last week, while our leader was in Minnesota, uh, we looked at how, what, what do we do while we wait for God Psalms, in Psalm 62. We wait with confidence, we wait with uh, hope, we wait with trust, we wait in silence, we wait in prayer. And I might have left out a couple, but you get the point. How we wait upon God is just as important as being delivered. And in the time between our prayer to God and God's deliverance, we're either going to waste our griefs, or we will look to see how God will use our griefs to help us to advance our faith in Him. Now, faith in the Lord, listen, means that we believe that God is not only willing to rescue us, but He is fully capable of doing so. You know, unfortunately, some Christians say, you know, I, I believe that God um, is, really loves me and He cares for me, and I believe that I'm saved, but, I, you know, this circumstance is so big, I'm not even sure God can handle it. And there are actually formalized theologies that, uh, that argue that God is just a victim just as we are. He would like to change things, but he can't. And so they have a diminished view of sovereignty, and that certainly doesn't help them at all, and that's not biblical. But there are other people that say God is absolutely sovereign, and I believe that he's fully in control of all things, but I'm just not sure he really loves me, and I'm not really sure he cares about my circumstance at all. So they have a diminished view of the love of God, see? And what we want to have is both of these things. Waiting on God is waiting with full confidence that our God is sovereign enough to deal with these things, powerful enough to save us without any assistance, and that because we are in relationship with Christ, He loves us and cares about every one of our circumstances, and He will be faithful, and He is not going to forsake us, and He is not indifferent to your pain. Knowing this does not necessarily, however, eliminate all fear and all anxiety and all doubt. It doesn't. Verse 29, but I am afflicted and in pain. You hear the transparency there? He is transparent. We can't, we can't just will ourselves out of suffering. I, I wish we could. Trusting God means we trust Him to do with our circumstances whatever is in our best interest and in the best interest of His glory. But that doesn't mean that emotions are not present. There are deep emotions in this psalm. No matter how much you trust the Lord, you're going to sometimes find these emotions coming to the surface. We've looked at psalms where David says he's in despair. We've looked at psalms where David is in terror and horror. We've looked at psalms where David says there are murderous liars against him. And here he is sinking, and he is sinking without any hope. Um, well, at least it would seem as such. And this is a desperate psalm. And yet, he knows what he must do. So he's not really without hope. He must go to God. God's the source of all salvation. You say, well, you mean from sin. Yes, from sin and from the wrath of God, but also from the troubles of this life. He not only emancipates us from our sins, but he will ultimately deliver us from all evil. He is the one to whom we call on when we need protection from our enemies or our enemy or the capital E. Now several images that you'll notice are used here to describe his plight. He's sinking in the mire. The floodwaters are rising. He's in deep waters. He's cried out to, the, to God where, uh, to the point where he is physically affected. Um, I have waited around in marshland before because I do things like that. And suddenly found myself sinking to the point where I thought I was in quicksand and where I was ankle deep and suddenly was like waist deep. And it is a scary feeling. Okay? But here it's not only that he feels he's sinking, but the floodwaters are rising. These metaphors are intended to convey to us that these threats are not trivial. Now here's the thing. When you lose your car keys, it's frustrating. And there is no reason why you shouldn't pray and say, Lord, will you help me find my car keys? Okay? 
Okay? There's no reason why you should say, Lord, will you not, will you please make my car start? Okay? God, God cares about all of everything that concerns us. But these are really, really high in afflictions, not the kind of daily troubles that we think about. David had enemies that wanted him dead. David had traitors within his midst. Uh, we've talked before about how he had a son named Absalom who, who constructed a mutiny against him that ultimately failed. But imagine your own son deciding that he's going to overthrow you. You think you've got family troubles. Okay? Now, we don't know if that's actually what this psalm is about. I mean, commentators turn every psalm into about Absalom. Okay? But it's just what they do. But here's the thing. Whatever this is, this does concern his enemies, and we know that because verse 4 says, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Who else does that describe? Jesus Christ. Every one of us born into this world is born an enemy of Christ until we come to faith in him. Paul says that you are by nature children of wrath. But not only that, but in his earthly sojourn, Jesus had people that would scoff and mock and slander and accuse and conspire to kill him. The hatred was so intense that the hatred ultimately led to, of course, the crucifixion. This hatred is so intense that it inspires an entire psalm. Murderous threats are like floodwaters that he cannot escape from. By the way, you may wonder why so often water is used in such a negative light in the Bible. Why is that? You read the Psalms and uh, the seas and the oceans and so forth don't seem tranquil and nice and pleasant. They seem very frightening. Well, it's because in the culture of that day, the open sea was simply a resource to live on, to live by. It was not a place to recreate. They would have known nothing of building beachfront property because people want to go to the ocean and they want to get in the ocean and so you want to facilitate that through tourism. That The ocean was not a tourist destination. The ocean was fearful and you only got on it because you needed to get something to survive. It was, not a, it was a place of mystery. It was a place of death. And so it's no wonder that here he uses this very effectively to demonstrate that the waters are rising above him. And the first, and the audience of that day would have said, that's exactly how it feels. But the dual imagery here is that he's sinking in the mire. So uh, think about this. On the one hand, he's sinking down into the mire, and at the same time, parallel to this, the floodwaters are rising against him. What's the point? The point is, is that he is, he is utterly unable to do anything to save himself other than to cry out to God. By the way, that's a picture of salvation, I would suggest to you. Uh, he's not talking about spiritual salvation here, but could I suggest to you that the condition of sinners is exactly this. What condition are unregenerate sinners in? They are sinking to rise no more. Their unbelief, their wicked hearts, their stubborn wills are all things that conspire to keep them in the mire of sin. Listen, people cannot save themselves by just deciding that they're going to exercise the will positively towards Christ and the gospel. God has to change the heart. The human will is not a friend. It is the very thing that keeps us from salvation. In fact, the will, as Martin Luther wrote, is in bondage. You know, a lot of times we speak of... Um, you know, uh, my free will, I tell my wife, I have free will to do what I want in this household. You know? uh, but we don't really have true free will. What we have is freedom of inclination. We will do what our wills are most inclined to do. And for an unbeliever, that will is set against Christ. So real freedom, real free will does not come until conversion. And then the sinner can say yes to Jesus. Yes, I want to worship Jesus, and I'm leaving my past behind, which is why in evangelism you have to understand you are fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit because you can't change that will. You simply are providing the sword, the gospel, the truth, and the Holy Spirit must come in and pull that will towards Christ. Um, I get excited when I talk about this because this was my conversion experience. It may have been a bit different for you. But when I was converted, I was running as far away from Jesus as I could in the summer of 1995. I wanted to resist the will of God and the clear conviction and the pursuit of God, uh, what Spurgeon called the hound of heaven. God's will won out, and I was joyfully converted. I joyfully embraced 
the gospel. But the psalmist is not speaking of his own sin here, having said that. He's speaking of the sins of others that have come upon him. You know, life is like that. The sins of others hurt us. Okay? The sins of others war against us. People will cast you down, given a chance, especially if you live for Jesus. They will cast you down. David was cast down. Jesus was cast down by the people that he created. Joseph was cast into the mire. The prophet Jeremiah was cast down into the pit. People are going to mistreat you if you're sold out to Jesus. Get used to it. You are not above your Savior, and neither am I. And, you know, Pat, this is very true for pastors, because pastors sometimes we think, we get the idea that, you know, we, we're, we're owed some kind of special gold star privilege, you know. How dare you treat me that way? Do you not know who I am? I'm clergy for crying out loud, you know. When you are mistreated, you need to see your suffering as partaking in the suffering of Jesus Christ. And you need to count it all joy, and you need to remember that he went into the mire long before you. Now, the psalmist is teaching us something very critical about prayer. Prayer is not always just an expression of thanksgiving. That's a constituent part of it, but it's not always that. Prayer is not always asking God to meet our daily needs. Prayer is sometimes desperation, absolute desperation. You know, too often we pray like we're ordering at McDonald's. And I'll take a, uh, Lord, I'll take a, a value meal and a strawberry shake, uh, and please get that out very quickly if you don't mind. And if you went to McDonald's or Dairy Queen or whatever, and they said, sorry, we're out of hamburgers and we're out of strawberry shakes, you might say, well, I'm never coming back here again. Hopefully you would act like that, but, you know, you might, depending on how hungry you are. Uh, or you might just kind of laugh it off and say, well, I guess I'll go someplace. Or you might order something else from the menu, but you're probably not going to beg. You're probably not going to say, well, please, McDonald's, I can't live without my strawberry shake. Can't you do something? But see, that's how God wants us to pray. He doesn't want us to pray like we're ordering McDonald's. Lord, would you please meet this need? Oh, okay, I guess not. I'll go on to something else then. He wants us to continue to cultivate that deep season of prayer and meet it till the end. Now, if it becomes clear, he's saying, no, okay. But we too often give up on prayer. Suffering has, here's the thing, listen. Suffering has a unique function and that it causes us to pray like we probably did not before, when things were easy. Suffering makes us intimate with God because we realize He's all we have and He's all we need. The psalmist is in deep mire. We don't know what the circumstances are, but it's mire, it's helplessness. He's imperiled. He feels like he's unable to come up for air. The water and the floods and the mire are all euphemisms for whatever it is that's going on in his life. Um, I saw a movie recently called Pressure. British action film uh, where these guys are going to go down to the bottom of the ocean in a pod separated from the ship and uh, just weld a pipeline. Very simple job, not a big deal. We'll go down to the bottom of the ocean, we'll go right back up. And a storm comes. And when they try to ascend, realizing that they have to get back to the ship, the forces of the storm push them back down to the bottom. And the craft is, is damaged and they begin to realize when they can't make contact with the ship, uh, they, they discover the ship has been destroyed, everybody on board has died, and the rest of the movie is them in this claustrophobic state trying desperately to send out a mayday and make contact with someone before their oxygen runs out and they die. Now, the setup of this movie was better than the actual execution. It wasn't as effective as I think it could have been, but it did remind me that this is that it's a very helpful metaphor for what David's going through. He is sending out a mayday to the Lord. He waits for the only God who can save him. And as verse 3 says, he says, he's weary with his crying. He is weary. He has drained himself. By the way, you know, it, 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 people did cry back then, not as quickly as we do. I mean, there were play times that you were to mourn at funerals and that kind of thing. Jesus wept at the funeral of Lazarus later on. Uh, it, it was not socially unacceptable to cry. But generally speaking, you wouldn't just become paralyzed with grief and just lay around and give up, like people do today sometimes. Um, there was no psychotropic drugs that you could appeal to to try to help you. Uh, but, you know, you had to kind of move on. And here's the thing. This is not David in a state of complete abandonment of all hope. He knows God can save him. His throat is parched from trying to get the attention of the heavens. He has wearied himself. He's drained himself. And the point is, we need to learn to pray like this. 
We really do. Not, you know, not every prayer has to start out like this. Not every day, prayer every day has to be like this. But if you never, ever weary yourself in prayer, it may be that you're not taking prayer seriously enough. And if you won't work on this kind of prayer life because you're too busy or too distracted or it's not a priority, God may bring things into your life to bring this about. Not because He's disappointed in you, not because He's mean, but because He loves you and wants you to have the kind of rich prayer life and intimacy with Him that will make your life really truly meaningful. And you know, it's in the mire and it's in the floodwaters that we often really find our hearts most deeply connected to the Lord and therefore to prayer. I mean, isn't it funny how at a, at, a, at a funeral everybody becomes suddenly very religious? It doesn't last for a lot of people. But there's something about grief and desperation that drives us away from ourselves and upward. Now, just a few points to summarize. Learn, first of all, learn to trust that God hears your prayers because He really does. The psalmist is not praying into an echo chamber here. He knows God hears. Be trusted in that. Be trusted. There is far too many Old Testament prayers of saints. And far too many New Testament prayers of saints that are modeled for us. For us to think that God is just ignoring us. And if you think God is ignoring you, that's either your flesh or that's the enemy. Jesus prayed and he modeled prayer. Listen, if you believe that this is the inspired word of God, that this is God's revealed word to you, do you understand that the point that he's making is, is that God hears our prayers? Trust it. Secondly, God responds to prayers. God answers them. Okay, we're going to get to the praise portion next time. But do you realize that Jesus encourages not merely to pray, but to believe that your Father in heaven will give you what you ask for, provided it's what is best for you. Okay? The psalmist, under divine inspiration, says in verse 13, Answer me with your saving truth. He's confident that God is going to answer. He's not angry. He's confident. He may not have experienced an answer at that time. But he pins the words by faith, knowing that God is faithful. Thirdly, God is willing and able to rescue us. Doesn't mean that he always rescues us when we want. Doesn't even mean that he always takes our suffering away. But he is near us. He continues to love us. He continues to work all of those things for our eternal good. That's Romans 8. You know, some people, as I said earlier, believe, you know, God, God's completely powerful and in control. But I'm not, not sure he really cares. Or he, he really loves me, but I'm not sure he's able. It is both. He is able to take the burden away. But even if he leaves it, he's able to give you the strength to bear up under it. Last point, Jesus went through all these things for you. Jesus went through all of these things that you see in the psalm. Jesus was cast into the mire of the cross. Jesus was cast into the mire of sin, though he was not a sinner. Jesus, Jesus was cast into the mire of the Father's wrath. Jesus was cast into a miry world in the Incarnation. He left paradise and immersed himself in sin and wickedness. Sometimes we sentimentalize the coming of Jesus. You know, like, hey, you know, this is the way the movies tend to do. I'm not critic, being critical of Christian movies. Sometimes, you know, they portray Jesus, and, and he, he's, he's born, and he, he just grows up, and everything's happy, and it's almost like the sound of music or something. This was a miry world. Do you realize that right after Jesus was born, already somebody wanted him dead? Herod, already he was in the mire of sin and, and corruption from Bethlehem. He left paradise for this world, and then he went into the floodwaters for his people. Look, 1 Peter 3 says this. The apostle speaks of Noah and the flood. When Peggy was baptized, I, I, I think I preached this pastor, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, one of the baptisms, okay? And how his family, uh, Peter reflects back on how Noah's family was carried safely through the flood, which represents, of course, the universal wrath of God. And he says that this event corresponds to baptism. That's kind of strange. How does Noah and the ark correspond to baptism? And he explains that baptism is a way, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the point, is a, is a way of representing being cast down into the grave, the very place that Jesus went for you. Jesus went into the grave because the penalty of sin is death, right? And even though he never committed any sin, God treated him as though he was the worst sinner ever by going through the waters of wrath and emerging safely after three days. Jesus becomes our prototypical ark. 
He provides safety in the day of God's coming wrath. Listen, Jesus hears your prayers, church. Jesus answers your prayers, but more than that, He went into the mire for you. He entered the floodwaters in your place. That's what we call substitution. So when you pray to Jesus, you're praying to someone who can legitimately say, I know how you feel. You ever say that to somebody and you're thinking, actually I don't. Ever been through that? Well, Jesus endured all the suffering that you ever could, only far much more and far greater was his was the grief of suffering. He went down, he was cast down into the waters of the wrath of the Father instead of you and me being subject to those waters. But his death for sinners and his rescue of sinners only applies if you put your faith and trust in him. Jesus knows what it means to feel as though you're sinking to rise no more. You know, upon that cross, you know, the psalmist says, I have no foothold. Jesus had literally no foothold because when you're crucified, you're trying to constantly raise yourself up to breathe and eventually you die from asphyxiation of mountain wounds. Jesus, the flood of the cross, was a torrent of blood spilt by our Savior, but ultimately victorious. Think about this. When Jesus is on the boat and the disciples are in a panic, what does he do? He calms the storm. He commands the elements. He has cosmological authority over the elements. And to draw a parallel, do you think he can calm the storms of your life? He makes the waves to stop breaking over us. If he could stop a storm, a real storm, don't you think he could stop the storm of cancer or hopelessness or despair or broken relationships? That's not to say that he always removes those things just like that, but he will see you from one end to the other. I think about Peter. I was thinking about this before I came here this morning. Uh, Peter on the boat. Whatever it was that happened, and we can talk about that another day, but Peter is walking across the water, and it begins to sink. And what happens? And that wonderful imagery, the Master comes and doesn't condemn him, but rescues him. Listen, we have a Savior who already saw us sinking and sinking and sinking in sin. And when we cry out, Abba, Father, help me, save me, O God. Do you realize that God recognizes that voice not just as the voice of a Christian, but as the voice of Christ? Because Jesus prays for us, and Jesus comes to us. He comes into our mire, he comes into our floodwaters, and he lifts us out of despair. Amen. What a wonderful Savior. Would you pray? Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we, we need these words so desperately, because we're either in a state of hurting, or...